Velina Meke Aloha, I'm Joshua Cooper, and welcome to Aloha Sustainability in Hawaii and Peace in our Pacific, the UN SDGs movement in Moana Nui Akea. Today, we're looking at reducing inequalities and realizing rights. SDG number 10 on self-sufficiency and self-determination. Today, we're looking at the important issue of Article 1 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the right of self-determination, as well as Article 3 under the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And when we look at reducing inequalities and realizing rights, we're joined by two amazing advocates and activists that are focusing on this issue. If we could begin with you, Maka, can you share with us what inspires you to focus on this issue of reducing inequality and why do you think it's so important for the people of Hawaii? Aloha mai kako, maono ma kanalani gomes. Aloha. Um, I'm one of three um, co-chairs of the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus. Um, thank you for the question. I think um, I think it's simple. I mean, when we can elevate voices, the voiceless or those that are oppressed in these in these systems of oppressive oppressions and um, these isms, you know, racism, settler colonialism, when we can highlight those voices and really bring them to the surface. Um, especially as Indigenous people, I think we're just echoing what, you know, our ancestors and er the ancestral elements and Earth Mother are facing, you know, and, and really, I think this idea that they have rights. So when we're talking about the, the way our rights are being violated, it's really in turn our echoing the, vo the rights of the land, the water, um, the rains, the winds that are being violated as well. And so we put out, we understand that it's our kuleana or our privileged responsibility to take care of these things, to steward these things. And so for me, um, I think it's just doing our part um, and playing our role. Um, and it is privileged. Uh, and I think my life course or my path and, and the mentors and the teachers and the kumus and the elders that I'm surrounded by are really have been mentoring us to take up this kuleana. And so like for me in my background, it's Mauna Kea, right? Like how are we elevating the voices of our mountains, the voices of our waters, um, of our ancestors for us as indigenous people? So um, it's critical because, because right now we're fighting for our lives, um, you know, and when we elevate our um, self-determination or our right to self-determine, we're really highlighting their rights to self-determine that they want to remain um, governing over themselves they want to remain these independent mountains these independent waters to sustain our lives freely um so it's critical because uh we're fighting for our lives and the lives of um earth mother and the ancestral elements mahalo for sharing that ike it's absolutely so essential the way we framed it and it's only really now that the western world's starting to understand what indigenous peoples have understood for centuries you can see that in Aotearoa, as you talked about Mauna Kea, they were giving rights to a river in Wanganui to then start to really catch up with the indigenous wisdom that has always been in the forefront. And so I think that's an amazing point to talk at and begin. And as you talk about self-determination, it's that sustainable development that's rooted in protecting our planet because it's the only planet we have. And it's taken too long for humanity to understand those important concepts. Lahele, can you share with us a bit about what inspires you and how you think this is one of the most important issues for people to be involved with? Yeah, um, aloha everyone. My name is Lahela Matos. So I actually grew up, right now I currently go to UH Manoa, but I grew up in Arizona as a part of the diaspora. And I think that my um, navigation and finding myself in my identity as a Kanaka Maoli uh, I think that that is what really inspires me because I think that finding what I believe to be true and like important to me was difficult, especially growing up, not seeing other people around me that looked like me. So I think that that's one of the biggest factors in why reducing inequalities is important to me because growing up in the diaspora, I saw how rising um, like housing costs and a lack of affordability affected my family. And how that really disconnected us from Aina, how that uh, like impeded on our Pilina with each other and the Aina that we come from, our ancestors. 
So I really realized how place is an important factor in just being a Hawaiian. And I think that reducing inequality is an important factor of that because now, currently, like I said, I go to UH Mano and I'm a, a planning student, an urban planning student, and I read about all these things about how our built environment was just meant to destroy our culture, destroy our peoples. So I think that going to school every day, being surrounded by it every day, climate change and other issues of inequality, I think that seeing it every day and kind of living it and being impacted by the first hand effects of it. I think that that's really what inspires me. And then also, I personally don't have keiki of my own, but both of my sisters have keiki. And I think that in understanding that I want them to have a pilina with the aina that their ancestors came from, that my parents have come from, I think that that's a big pushing factor as well, because I think that all of the kids here, I see that like as more and more generations grow up away from home. Right now I'm in Arizona the more and more time that we spend away from Hawaii, the more disconnected that we're able to become. And it's kind of like we just have small, faint, like mannerisms and um, ways of life that try to relate to being Hawaiian, but it's never going to be the same without having Aina, without being connected to that place. So the future life for these keiki is really what pushes me. And then also my own experiences in um, being a part of the diaspora. Mahalo. And it really does it remind me of a meeting I was just in a week ago where they're talking about right to housing and showing the interconnectedness of all the issues, which we understand if you do a human rights lens and you're focusing on the issues such as existential threat of climate change. But most people don't make those connections. They're just living in, in silos. But for the first time, more people live outside Hawaii than live inside who are from here. And so your story is so important because it does shape so many aspects. And the reason people are forced to, to leave is because of the colonial structure that is pushing the financialization of housing, pure capitalist system that doesn't recognize the host culture. And so this why is why SDG number 10 and the entire UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is so crucial. And if we look at it, for peoples and nations to flourish, equality and prosperity must be available to everyone, regardless of gender, race, religious belief, or economic status. And when every individual is self-sufficient, the entire world will prosper. And that's not what people understand because they're always trying to control and contain and not allow those visions, those values of Kanaka Maoli people to flourish. And so I understand the important work that you do. Can you share some of the projects and some of the work you're doing, what impact you see on reducing inequality, either on the ground, on our campus or in the community or at the global civil society level where you're both involved with the Global Youth Indigenous Caucus. Up in the line. Yeah, Mahalo, I can um, answer. I think <clears throat> kind of to piggyback on what Lahala was talking about, uh, really about, um, you know, the, the kuleana that is being passed down from our elders um, and our parents and that generation to steward it to, to the next generation. And, as, um, and that's something I think we are really trying to strive for in the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus, involving more youth. Um, and I think that also means that we have to um, help help create uh, brave spaces that will hopefully in, ensure our safety because um, these spaces or, or just in our societies, in the, in the different pockets and where we indigenous people grow up, um, we don't always, that's not always guaranteed, right? Because that self-sufficiency factor. Um, and I think something that we're doing in the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus that has been really beautiful uh, last October, we launched um, a, a global campaign on indigenous food systems. Um, so again, that intrinsic or that boarding um, the narrative that our intrinsic well-being um, is is locked into our food system, is locked into our waters, well-being is locked into our mountains. When we can continue to advocate for all of the global family, um, not just indigenous people, to understand that there is an intrinsic link to our wellness, right? In our food systems and perpetuating um, indigenous knowledge systems um, because we can farm an, an agro system. And like Lahela said, all of these things developed, but if they're developed with the, with the intent to exterminate a certain group or marginalize a certain group, we, we will never be um, sustainable and we will never like live in Pono and, and aligned. So the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus has um, done that. 
Um, we've also partnered with others doing futures work, right, with the 2030 agenda. Um, and, and I think the most important is in, within our communities and on the ground. So um, a lot of, I think, folks are learning their languages, um, sitting with their elders, um, learning their healing traditions, learning their weaving traditions. Um, and that looks different in all of our societies. And I, I think that was something that I was really amazed with and humbled by is that all of us are taking these opportunities to, to sit with, especially coming out of a global pandemic, is to sit with the, those that we have left to learn from them. Because I think it's a rare opportunity that I've noticed that we're getting to ascend into leadership roles while our elders are still alive, while our teachers are still alive, because that wasn't the case 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, people were pushed into positions because their elders were dying. And, and we kind of saw that in the pandemic. And I think that's something that I wanna highlight that that's what indigenous people are learning and taking. And we never took that for granted is that as youth, we want to learn from our elders and our communities while we still have them. And, and it, the same goes for those resources. In Hawaii on our campus right now, I'm a graduate assistant at the Native Hawaiian Place of Learning Advancement Office under um, Dr. Kaivi Puni Kaui Kaveku Puni Hei Leip. And um, we do some really amazing work around, uh, we are, the whole campus, the University of Hawaii at Manoa is a truth, racial healing and transformation campus. And that's some Ike that comes from the continent and comes from a practice throughout um, America where we, um, and, and we've adopted what's called a racial healing circle into what we call a pilina circle. And Lahala mentioned the word pilina. And so really we're trying to cultivate relationship with self, with land, with each other, because through these systems of hierarchy, of racism, um, these constructed um, hierarchies, we've lost that pilina. So when you're, when you're saying, Right. A lot of people don't see the connection. It's because these systems, right, like capitalism and the patriarchy are keeping us um, from from understanding that we're a lot alike. We're a lot more alike, whether we're indigenous or not, than we are um, not um, not alike. And even with the mountains, right, a mountain needs water. A mountain needs air. We're the same. And so whenever I think we can continue to do that. Um, so look out. We are going to um, have more programming as we've really been considerate of the global pandemic and taking everyone's health and wellness seriously. So we will have more, um, more rolling out in the summer and into fall. Uh, we are also are helping to teach Belina Manoa, um, a sh one of the shorter Oli or chants for Manoa. So with the intention that people again can connect to place, um, that Manoa isn't this, just this valley, it becomes, um, it really lives into an existence, like the rains and the winds um, become something that we become intimate with. And I think um, I saw a quote today and, and I, I love um, Dr. Jamaica Heoli Osorio's book about remembering our intimacies. And they said, leadership isn't about power, it's about relationships. And so I think I was meant to say that here in this space and that, um, you know, here in Hawaii, we're doing that. In, in, and I'm learning my healing practices as, as like I, I said, a lot of our youth are, are doing that in their communities. It's important to do, um, I think, a, you know, a quote that I like is um, think locally, act globally. And so um, I think that's something that we really do really well. And I'm really proud of it in the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus and just proud of individual um, Indigenous youth. Yeah. So much there, extremely astute and Akamai in every way. I love how you brought up food systems, because as we look at food sovereignty, it connects all the issues. It's no poverty, it's zero hunger, it's good health and well-being, it's quality education, education that's based on makahanika ike with in the action, that's where the knowledge is, not a quiz, not some random aspect of did you remember something, but putting into practice those deep philosophical perspectives that matter most to the future of Hawaii, but the whole planet. I also thought you did a great job at really sharing so much that I, I really want to talk about in the sense that we are looking at bringing the new member of the, there's a new UN permanent forum on African descendants, and they're looking at coming to Hawaii as well in January. And one of the exciting things they said was, Hawaii is so forward thinking and such a progressive ideology because it understood the example of fairness and working together. And your quote from Jamaica is absolutely essential because 
it is pilina, it is people, it is working together. It is that sense that you talked about, Rachel, healing of Ubuntu from South Africa, that none of us can become fully who we are if anyone is denied any aspect of their humanity. So really touched upon a whole lot there and exciting aspects as you can see going forward. And it's great for you to connect campus community, capital, and then global civil society in such a great way. Uh, Hela, can you share with us a bit about what you're involved with and some of the impact you're seeing in the islands based on the important work that you're doing? Yes, so actually I'm also part of the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus. Makana Lenny did a great job last year of mentoring us at the permanent forum. There was me um, and one of our other sisters that came, but um, Makana Lenny did a great job of mentoring us. And I think that that's kind of like very relevant to speak about now, because I think that sisterhood, not only in the UN arena, but um, as women, sisterhood in all of these scary, scary spaces, such as academia, um, that's really what keeps me going and allows me to keep moving forward in systems that are meant to oppress us. So that's the the first thing that I want to um, acknowledge. She had helped us through the process of becoming Pacific Focal Points, where we have been able to um, try to include more other, like uh, other Pacifica. I think that was an issue last year was that because of COVID, because of other issues such as climate change, a lot of Pacifica weren't able to come to the UN and they weren't able to express themselves. And even though sometimes it can feel so far across so, so much water, whenever we, even this year I saw it, whenever we connected with other people who were from the Pacific, it felt like home. Like we, we had all of these commonalities, even if it wasn't the same uh, exact stories, uh, there were so many similarities that I think allowed us to continue building community and not only with other Pacifica, but also just indigenous youth in general. So I think that that's one of the biggest, um, the biggest takeaways that I've had from being a, a part of the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus is connecting with other youth from other regions. It's so warming to be able to connect with other youth and tell them about our culture and listen to them and say, listen to their stories about them being like, hey, I have that in my culture as well. And it's just really warming, especially because as Indigenous people, I think that we navigate spaces in a way where we don't always connect with other people. So being able to be in a space where we're able to connect with everybody around us, it was just really heartwarming. Um, so beyond the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus and being a Pacific focal point, um, I'm also a master's student at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I'm a graduate student under Dr. Lili Kala Kama'elehiva, and right now we're working on a genealogy project. So I think that that's another way that um, we try to develop like su sustainable thinking and um, just reconnection to ancestral knowledge is a big thing that Dr. Lili Kala tries to focus on. And as students, um, she allows us to fully express ourselves and try to think about innovative ways as to how to approach genealogy to include as many people as we can, because she realizes that genealogy is a difficult topic, especially with being disconnected from land, being disconnected from identity. Um, so part of our work on our graduate body um, project is to make genealogy more accessible to more people. And I think that that's something that hits close to home for me, like I said, uh, being someone as a part of the diaspora. And then kind of touching on that topic last, making sure that everything that I learn in these higher spaces of academia, I'm going back home and I'm teaching people in my community. I'm teaching people in my family because not everybody has access to these things. I was the first in my family to graduate um, or to even get a bachelor's degree. Some of my aunties and uncles didn't even graduate high school. So I think about that and it's like these, they were never meant to learn these things in a system like this. But I think that I hold like a very strong kuleana to try to teach them that. And then, like I said, the kiki, trying to just teach them everything that I've learned and perpetuate as much knowledge as I can. Really good points. And it reminds me as well, when I was at UH, I was so fortunate to have Hanani K. Trask sharing with me when she first went to Geneva and mm -hmm. what she did there with the working group on indigenous populations when she went there in the early 1980s. And Mililani, of course, being on the permanent forum as the first representative to be able to share that with her. And I was fortunate as well. I had Lili Kala as my teacher in one of my first graduate courses where she brought in Ward Churchill, she brought in Sami, 
she brought in First Nations. So I got to see what only I had only read about. So that was so exciting. And you can see Makanala, you're already not even to that elder status, but you're already then sharing. And that message comes out so well as you shared it. Like no one speaks UN. When you go to the UN, there's so many acronyms and it's a, a whole new language. But then the other side is we see the struggles global. And as you described in the shared, the hella about meeting other youth, you're like, oh my gosh, Sami, definitely different, leather pants, reindeer, you know, but they're struggling against a new green energy project, putting things up without free power and informed consent. And that's something we see in Hawaii all the time, all in the name of development and progress. So we see it's one struggle. And then that aspect of knowing that if we don't teach each other and we don't share that knowledge that no one will really advance. And that's where, as you were sharing earlier, that 2030 agenda, it does provide 17 global goals to accomplish and actualize the 2030 agenda around the world. And SDG 10 focuses on reducing inequalities and realizing the rights for everyone on earth. But then your point you brought up, it's also SDG 16, peace, justice, and strong institution. And if we don't have that at the core of everything in our classroom, everything on our campus, and then everything we're doing in our community, nothing will really get better. So I thought maybe you could share with us a bit as well, because not everybody gets to go to the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous issues. Could you share a highlight of that experience this year and some of the things that happened? And then we can then share that knowledge with other people that maybe didn't participate. I know one thing that I was excited about was the new study on tourism and Indigenous peoples, but there were so many aspects, there are so many side events, so many caucus meetings. It'd be great to hear from your perspective as you were both there for the full time, what really spoke to you and what others should know about here in Hawaii. I think um, three things, as I know we're a little tight on time. Um, one, I wanna start off with something really great is indigenous joy and especially the youth. Like when we, like Lahela said, when we come together and I just, I just remember seeing so many pictures being taken with all of us, you know, not necessarily in the UN, but afterwards and just at dinners and things and just seeing, right, like you said, the different clothing and the different, um, or the or different um, cultural, you know, cultural uh, significant items on our, you know, our, our adornments and seeing that. And I just remember taking almost like an image in my head and thinking, this is joy. This is so beautiful because sometimes we're really robbed of that and i think as youth too so i'll say that for sure indigenous being together and in, and and when when i think there are systems that, that keep us apart and especially sometimes even in the un with our difficulties through security etc but the fact that we always come together and we can realize that we are a part of an indig a larger indigenous family second i'll say that i think like lahalo mentioned about sisterhood it's a really i do some work here um about mur raising awareness about murdered missing indigenous peoples particularly feminine peoples to spirit people mahu women girls um and so i i'm glad because it needs to be mentioned that you know women are being um gone missing, being murdered at a disproportionate way, especially especially indigenous women who are are in the forefront and protecting, you know, Earth Mother and the resources. And third, I'll say that yesterday I saw um, on the Special Rapporteur's IG page, so a lot of folks at home, you know, please interact with these social media platforms that maybe if you can't make it to the UN, the different bodies of the UN, you can engage on social media. They've done a really good job at that. But the Special Rapporteur on Indigenous issues does have his own personal um, IG. And um, I'll just say the part that he said, the main areas of concern of this mandate include violation of the rights to self-determination and self-government through a state practice of not recognizing the existence of Indigenous peoples, escalation of conflicts, and continued militarization of Indigenous peoples' ancestral lands. The fact that that was named so high, I really felt like we we had done a really great job at continuing to bring this message that our elders have been saying since Haunani K's days, Kumu Haunani's days, Kumu Lilikala's days, Kumu Kelly's, and then now into ours. But but there were so many youth that when we when I they we reshared this, they were they felt vindicated that our voice has really been heard, not just because green economy projects, but the militarization part. I think so many people do not see that they are playing war games all over our sacred lands and they're using our lands as these playgrounds 
to to commit genocide on people that we, I think, as indigenous people want to connect with and not want to harm. Um, so I think that's really important that the world see that militarization is affecting us all. Um, weaponization, this this new technology, you know, in the, um, what is that called? Military tech is a new frontier and people have to be aleu about it. They have to watch out for for these kinds of things. But it, it made me really grateful to, to see that I think our voice was carried through that militarization is being a high priority, just like tourism. No, great points. And it, it reminds me of when we look at what matters most, that is where the permanent form sort of allows us to get that sense. And joy is perfect because we look at justice a lot, but it is that global circle of friendship of people caring for one another and understanding each other's story just from the moment you meet. And it's the one time where the United Nations looks like the United Nations should be. It's not suits and ties. It is every color. It is every connection and representation of connection to the Aina that different people bring from all over. And that's one of the most cherished moments I'll have is the friendships I've built over those decades there as well. But Hello, would you like to add something as well about your favorite UN experience? I pretty much just call Ko, what Makanalani said, um, heavy on the like building relationship with other peoples. I think it's so important, like Makanalani said, having indigenous joy. We even talked about like trying to bring everybody back to Hawaii because as as youth, especially, we deserve a space to be happy and not just fight all the time, like fight for our rights, fight for our livelihood. And I think that that's like a perfect note to end on is that we deserve happiness in all spaces and we shouldn't have to constantly just be advocating for ourselves in every arena. So true. And when you look at that, I remember too, in my college days, it's always the struggle, the struggle for self-determination and to have that free moment where you actually can just be with one another to appreciate each other and all that we are. That's just something we don't have. Uh, I think under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it's Article 24, uh, right to rest and leisure. But it's that space to be able to just be together. And when you look at the goal of 2030, it humanity is empowered and promotes a social, economic, and political inclusion of all, irrespective of age, sex, disability, race, ethnicity, origin, religion, economic, or other status. And SDG 10 is really working towards that ensuring equal opportunity, reducing inequalities of outcome incomes, including by eliminating discriminatory laws, policies and practices, and promoting appropriate legislation, policies and action. And as we look at the end of the legislative session, we know there's so much more that we want to do. Could you share just a bit your vision of the future on this important issue of reducing inequality going forward? I, I, I think, um... For me, I like to I like to say I like to tell people it really starts with you and individually, whether you're indigenous or not. You know, I think assess your your um, positionality to privilege, assess how you're taking care of your the plant in your room, your backyard if, or your if you have a plant on your balcony. You know, it's, it's these tiny, these 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 micro things, I think. You know, you mentioned Makahana Kaike, but I think there's not enough folks doing it in your own life. You know, if you you know, the, it's famous now, like with all this self-care, you can't pour from an em empty cup, but there's not enough people really looking within. And I think um, I feel very thankful and, and much gratitude that we have communities that are that are telling us as young people to start with ourselves, you know, heal ourselves, right? Like as if we treat ourselves as ecosystems and, and governments or, you know, within ourselves, and, and we work on that, then I think we're going to be able to do the work in our community, to do the work in our nations and to the, do the group, to do the work on our aina or, or our territories. And I think that's really important. I want to see more people take personal accountability to what they're doing to, to live these human rights, to, leave, to live these indigenous rights, to live these SDGs in their own personal lives so that they can do it in community. Because if you... You cannot make relationships with other people if your relationship with self and your ohana or your family is not right. And I feel like that maybe feels like a call out, but I feel like it's a really a call in because as I'm listening to myself, I am also reminding myself that I need to listen to my own advice as well. We're not, no one is, is um, unscathed, you know, um, from this advice. But as I look at Mauna Kea, I think, that's for me very much accountable. How am I taking care of myself 
so that when this mountain needs me, I can take care of them, you know? Absolutely. And it really does summarize what we're all feeling, but maybe don't have enough time to share because the world looks at profit, bottom line, and, and not considering what matters most, which is people and our planet. And you also inspired me because we did that just recently at Kalana Omawi. We colonized the front yard. So it's now all Kalo as well as tea everywhere there. And it's everyone taking a small action. So hello, can you share with us your vision of the future as well? Yeah, I think just reiterating what I said earlier about like having a safe Hawaii for the keiki, especially making sure that we see Hawaiians in Hawaii, making sure that we that the the keiki around me are able to play in the yard or go go somewhere without me being scared, me being nervous or protective. So I think that that's like my biggest vision. And then kind of like Makana Lenny was saying, just like restoration of all of these systems that make us us. I think that that's just my biggest vision for the future. Mahalo, thank you so much. And it definitely reminds us of the next step we can all take. We know Hawaii will be reviewed under the voluntary local review, looking at all 17 global goals. So we can explore and engage on how we want to make sure that the issues you've shared today are brought up again in July 17 through 19 during that important review. But thank you both for all the work that you do and mahalo so much for sharing that perspective and enlightening all of us today. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.